Hey, welcome to Inside the Album. I'm Don Seckler. He's Tommy Hilkin. Well, you almost forgot on that one, Don. Yeah, I'm Tommy Hilkin. <laughs> <laughs> What's your name? <laughs> and I got this guy with me this week. And, this uh, guy picked him up, side of the road. Yeah. Sounded good. Roadkill. So <laughs> <laughs> so uh inside the album we're all about telling the stories be behind your favorite albums we're going to dive deep into this uh mm -hmm. album by the beatles this is abbey road all-time great album uh before you before we do that though please subscribe click the buttons like give us a five-star review do whatever you can on whatever nice. platform you're on and um that'll definitely help us out and help us uh, be able to continue here and so we also are tying in a charity element to the podcast, and we're working with a charity called Music for Mark. So tell us about Music for Mark. Yes. Hey, thanks, Don. And yes, please click uh, like us, tell your friends about us, all that good stuff. Only five-star reviews. Only. Thank you. Right. Only. We no will two. get rid of the other one. <laughs> no two stars. <laughs> we're, we're, we are five stars. All right. <laughs> So let's talk about music for Mark, why we're doing this so we can raise awareness for it. Uh, what we're doing is we're bringing the gift of music to kids mm -hmm. through uh, musical lessons, musical instruments, whatever we can do. The foundation is going to supply the instruments and lessons to people, kids, people who need it. You know, let's face it, your love and mine for music is where it's all about for the rest of our lives. So if we can continue to bring music to the world, we're doing it through music for Mark. So check us out at musicformark.com. Cool. Yes, definitely give it a look and help us out. Uh, that would be great. Thanks. So let's talk about the Beatles. Abbey let's, Road to me let's. is, I mean, this is to me what my favorite Beatles album. The band, I think everybody knows the Beatles, but we'll run through them anyway. It's <laughs> John Lennon, vocals and guitar. Paul McCartney, vocals and bass, George Harrison, vocals and guitar, and Ringo Starr, vocals and drum. I mean, these guys are you know, just amazing, amazing, talented songwriters. And I, the thing people don't realize, Tommy, I don't think, is that the Beatles released 13 albums in nine years. Think yeah. about that. What, what band? I mean, some bands take nine years between albums. <laughs> but that, yeah, that's the whole thing. It's not only the songwriting, you know, it's just that every time they got together, something got created. You know, they were an interesting group. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, we'll talk about a lot of the elements of what went into them. This is kind of the Beatles at the tail end, actually at the very end of their of their uh, existence as a group. Uh, and there was a lot of tension and a lot of different things going on, which we'll dive into. But I think that also kind of drove this album to become so great. Oh, yeah. One of the, like you said, one of the all time best. As we go through the songs and we talk about who wrote them and who who added what to it i think we'll find out a lot about it yeah so they started recording this album in february of 1969 the real sessions i guess uh started in the summer but they had started doing some work on some of these songs early in the year and the album came out in september of 1969 it, it took them about a year to get all this stuff together at the time there was a lot of a, a lot of rock on the charts you had uh led zeppelin 2 album which kind of played with abbey road and knocked it out of number one and then abbey road came back into number one so there's that back and forth with zeppelin you had Santana on the charts. You had Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Simon and Garfunkel was huge with Bridge huge. Over Troubled Water. So, you know, that was kind of the landscape at the time. You know, as we talk about albums, think about what you're saying here, right? The music, the artists that we're talking about when we're just covering who was in the era itself, right? right? Not, not too many people would even think about listening to Blood, Sweat, and Tears, but no, just tremendous, tremendous band. Yeah, tremendous. hugely popular at the time. Oh, no um, doubt. So this album, like I said before, they released 13 albums in nine years, which to me is is amazing because every album is so good. There were no, <laughs> there was no clunkers. There was never a bad Beatles album, you know? This album, Abbey Road, sold 31 million copies worldwide. And mm. it went to number one in nine different countries. And it was also on Rolling Stone's best albums of all time list at number five. So, it, it, you know, very, very highly, highly regarded album for sure. A tremendous album. Beatles overall, you know, for me, as we think about the Beatles, I don't know about you, but 
you know, the first album I got hooked on is naturally another one we could probably cover is the White Album. You know, sure. just yeah, yeah. Just, oh, I love the White just, Album. Just took me right where I want to go. And then I, you know, I was a little under, then McCartney came out with Ram, which was a solo album. So I've been hooked on this, and naturally, you know me, my love for George Harrison. Right. All things must pass. So think about what the Beatles have created song wise, and we'll talk about exactly. that a little bit. And a yeah. lot of those, a lot of those songs that were on their first solo albums came from these sessions. They were uh, writing them. They, but they decided not to use them on Abbey Road for a, a, a you know, a number of different reasons. So the band at this point was kind of coming to an end. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of stress recording the White Album. They did the White Album, then they did Let It Be, which at the time was going to be called Get Back, um, and they hated let it be that everybody if you ever saw the movie which has been basically removed from the market you can see the stress and and how unhappy the band is they didn't like the album and there was a lot of fighting brian epstein had died so the band had to deal with all the business side of things and i think they just had had it and they started getting on each other's nerves and that showed in the white album recording and then let it be and then at the beginning Paul said to the other guys, let's try to do a really great album. He was trying to kind of, you know, give the band CPR and still wanted them to continue. Yeah. Yeah. He was that kind of a guy, but they had just about had it. And, you know, you talk about the things you hear about the Beatles throughout life. And, you know, it was literally John Lennon just was so relieved because he even said, look at the great music that came out after we broke up. You know, they, yeah. they knew that the tension was no longer created it was really damaging their creativity. Right. So it freed them up. It really it did. did. And, you know, uh, sometimes the tension can be helpful, but at this point, I think it was so bad that they just couldn't carry on with it. Yeah. Um, so let's, let's start off by talking about the album cover, which is iconic for, for a number of reasons. Um, the thing, you know, so we'll, we'll get into some of the, some of the details about this, but the interesting thing to me about this was that Paul said that they kind of just is like, it was a, like an offhand idea. They were at the studio. He said, okay, let's take a half hour. We'll get a photographer down here and we'll just walk in the crosswalk a couple times and, and shoot it. So they were, the, the, the original name of this album was going to be Everest. And I had no idea what, no idea why. And they were literally going to fly to Nepal and have a picture taken. Right. And when we talk about why they ended up doing this was they were just like, let's go in the street. Yeah, let's it'll be easy. This, let's get this done. <laughs> right. Let's just go outside and do it. We're not flying anywhere. Right. And so the day they shot it, it was August. It was super hot in, in England. And so the reason Paul McCartney is barefoot, he was wearing a pair of sandals. Yeah. And he and he just kicked them off as a casual thing. It wasn't even a thought, a plan or anything like that. Nothing about the cover was planned, you know, so it was just all so random. Oh, but just think of the cover, right? Yeah. That cover has gotten more exposure than anything in the world. And I, and I mean that you know, it, it has so much meaning. And we'll go through the things that people would talk about. I can remember as a kid, you know, thinking about the fact that Paul is dead. You know, right. it's, and it's, that's this came from that. Do you want to tell us about that? How that rumor got started? Well, it was literally they were showing the way they were crossing the street, and John was in white. And you know, back in when I was thinking, and people were pointing it out, that was literally George was in all denim, so he was like the grave digger. These right. are the things that we talked about. John was in white; he was the spirit, right? Paul was barefoot. Their feet are out of line. Paul's the only ones whose feet are out of line, so there was something right. off there. But, but go ahead, tell us about the Volkswagen, because I know that's one of your favorite parts that is yeah, so, sitting there. So there's this Volkswagen parked on the street. And if you, <laughs> you know, kind of, you can't really zoom in on an, on, a, on an actual physical album, but you can see that the license plate is 28 IF, meaning that Park McCartney would have been 28 if he had lived. But the problem with that was that at the time of this photo, he was 27. So it really, some of these things don't really make sense. And the other thing that was interesting was Paul is holding a cigarette in his right hand. Mm. <laughs> and so everybody said, well, that makes, makes, makes him an imposter. It's a fake Paul because he was lefty. I, you know, it's crazy stuff, but people I think were really reaching for it, but it was a fun story. 
Well, it went on. It went on forever. You know, you got me thinking about it. You know, we always talked about was this the real, you know, like a, a fake Paul McCartney stuck in there. Yeah. Boy, right. boy, he looks a real lot like the one, <laughs> the original. Plus, you know, so he's, did a plus he's amazing on stage. You know, he's, yeah. like I saw Paul McCartney a couple of years ago. Insanely good show still at, you know, whatever he's seven oh, or dude, however old he is. Amazing. Yeah. I saw him at Yankee Stadium. Just crazy good. Crazy yeah, yeah yeah so uh so he's amazing. a lot he's alive and well yeah right, thank you right <laughs> so you know people love these these kind of conspiracy type things and but unfortunately none of it's true so paul is alive a great um, way to sell albums <laughs> yeah exactly so one of the things when they started talking about paul was talking to george martin and he wanted him to come back and produce and george is like listen it, if i come back there's going to have to be discipline, especially from John. So we're not going to have this crazy situation anymore. Everybody's got to kind of listen to me, let me produce and, and, you know, be part of the team here to help drive the creative process. Everybody kind of agreed with that. And, and they were able to move forward with George Martin producing. That's great. You know, that's what the challenge is. Somebody's got to step in. It's kind of like, you know, we, we talk about it a lot. Bands get together. You need a marriage counselor. Right. You, know, you, re you need somebody to say, hey, what's your thoughts on this? And if you respect the guy and you really enjoy being with them, you'll listen to him. You'll be open to him. Right. It's so helpful for every band. And everybody knows about the Yoko stress from the Let It Be sessions and <laughs> you know, Yoko. sat on somebody's amp. I think it was George's amp and George and John got pissed off at each other. But there was other all this stuff with Brian Epstein being dead. The, these guys all now had to deal with all the other BS that goes with it. They, the non-musician stuff, all the, all the business stuff. And so, you know, that had them, again, at odds with each other. No, uh, you know the phrase, man. We've we've done it. I've lived it. It's the idea of everybody wants to be in showbiz. Everybody right. loves the show, and nobody wants to do the biz. Yeah, but it's the biz that drives the bucks. Yeah, and so Paul and and actually all four of the Beatles thought that Let It Be was kind of not a great album. I right. like it a lot, but they weren't happy with it. So he got everybody to <laughs> kind of put take off the you know get get out of fight mode and and get into trying to put together a really great album uh as you know what could be their last album could you imagine if let it be came out as their first album it'd be the greatest album ever released right right <laughs> but because of the history everybody yeah. kind of sloughs it off but i, I oh love my. it as an album oh dude one of my favorites yeah so some, there's some george tunes on there oh yeah yeah always very important so the the other thing was when this album came out the critics did not there was a kind of a lukewarm reception to it uh, there was a lot of effects on the album. It was the first time a Moog synthesizer had been used. George had one custom made for him. Nice. And so they were using that for the first time. So it was a lot of like today, you know, the effects are way different with all the, the auto tune and all this stuff that these oh. guys use. Right. Back then it was just basically you plugged in your guitars and amps and, and you played and there wasn't a lot of uh, a, that much effects. I mean, you had Hendrix like using Waz and, and, and other pedals and things like that. But this went beyond that with a lot of extra sound effects that uh, the critics initially said, oh, they're trying too hard. You know, George always liked to try different things. I think that was his way of staying involved. Yeah. You know, let's think of they they pushed him down a lot. You know, it was like, you know, really when you think Lennon McCartney, Lennon McCartney, Lennon McCartney, everywhere you went. But George was a big, big part of the band. So, you know, he would try a lot of different things. I think it was for the sake of himself staying involved in the band. Yeah, yeah, I see that. And, you know, yeah. it's when you have a group even ringo is a, a good songwriter you know he's not the best but ringo yeah. had the ringo had the first hits as a, as a solo beetle so oh. when you've got these guys with all this talent you you know you've only got 10 to 12 slots on an album there's going to be some competition as to who's whose rec whose songs make it to the record you know all the time and i like i mentioned it you know, John was very pleased the fact of the music that got released after they broke up. He said, look at the great music exactly. that was created after. And most people don't think about that, but look at the great music created after. So oh, yeah, definitely. A blessing a and a curse to everybody in the world. Yeah, definitely a lot of great songs. And and a couple oh. of those, 
uh, Come and Get It, the the Paul McCartney song, and then All Things Must Pass were two songs that they had demos for for this album, but ended up not putting it on the record. Well, Come and Get It put uh, Badfinger on the map. That's who covered that. Yeah. So when you think about it, Badfinger was a, like a George Harrison production kind of thing. And they 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 were the first band to record at uh, Abbey Road when it became Apple Studios. And a uh, pretty interesting way to look at it that, uh, you know, now they were pushing their songs out to other people. Right. Yeah. So that, that was interesting as well. All right. So let's dive right into the songs here. We'll start off with uh, Come Together. Wow. So good. So good, right? <laughs> Don, the the underrated Paul McCartney on bass. Uh, amazing, amazing yeah. what he could do. Well, you know what happened with this song? So John wrote this originally as a song for Timothy Leary, who was going to run for governor of California. There you go. <laughs> so that, that'll tell you where John's head was at at this time, hanging around yeah. with the acid man, <laughs> Timothy Leary, right? Timothy Leary, yeah. And to think that he was running for governor. Hey, yeah, but, right? So right. crazy. So the, his, his campaign never panned out. You know, there was nothing there. <laughs> but the slogan, it was, it was it, the slogan for, for Leary was come together, join the party. So, you know, that was his campaign slogan. So it triggered this idea for the song that John wrote. And since the campaign never really took off, they ended up recording it. But your point to Paul, uh, Paul made a big change to this song. So he kind of came in and said, hey, let's slow it down, get it a little bit swampy with that bass and drums vibe, which you can kind of, that's that, you know, mm. again, that that real groove in the back, right? And yeah, this... Paul said he came up with the bass line and the song just took off from there. So, you know, a lot of times, even though it was a John song, the other Beatles definitely were contributing uh, uh, in the process a lot of the times. Yeah, Paul Paul had his hand in almost every song, if not every song that the Beatles ever recorded. You know, the story goes that he always wanted to either be singing back up or in it on something. It's right. just who he was. And listen, when you hear the songs, you realize why somebody took control. And I really think it was Paul after a while, you know? Yeah, I definitely think it. Well, this is definitely kind of Paul's record since he kind of marshaled the troops and tried to get everybody back together. It, this, but it, the the improvements that he made on a lot of these things were just so huge. So that really, it's so much better with with you know that really kind of low key swampy sound that he wanted to get in there. Yeah, I, I couldn't imagine listening and improving that. I mean, that's that's the talent of these guys. I yeah. mean, just walk into a room, somebody's jamming on something, try it this way. Boom. Killer. So John actually, and this was after the record was released, got sued for stealing the riff and the Here Comes Old Flat Top from yep. uh, a Chuck Berry song called You Can't Catch Me. Yep. It wasn't Chuck Berry who sued him. But it was this guy, Morris Levy, who, uh, you know, was this guy who was in the music industry and he had bought up thousands of early rock songs that he uh, he got from poor, uh, mostly black artists, unrepresented artists. Yeah. So he ended up suing John. Um, but at the end, John kind of decided, OK, instead of paying this guy off, I'm just going to go ahead and record some of his songs on John's solo album. Uh, which was the rock and roll album of covers. So he he wanted to do the record anyway. This guy owns some cool cover records, uh, some cover songs, and John was able to, you know, kind of satisfy that that lawsuit through that process. You know, as we were doing this, I listened to the Chuck Berry song, and it's really the only phrase is "Here comes old flat top." Yeah, you know, and. Uh... Really? When you think about it, is that stealing a song? It's stealing well, the riff too, though, right? Isn't the <laughs> kind, riff the same? Kind of, sort of. Yeah. Yet, yet not. Close enough. Well, 
close enough. I guess he just really didn't want to be bothered with it, Lennon. You know what I mean? He got yeah. to that point in his career, too, was what do I do to get this out of my hair? I really right. don't need right. this. He's, you know, he's not worried about money because the Beatles at this point had just this is they were, oh. had more money than anybody at this point. Uh, no, John was into his do not disturb life. Right, right. He really was. Oh, yeah. So the other interesting thing about this song was that this is the first, uh, it was the first song that John participated in the sessions uh, for the album. So he had had a car accident, him and Yoko and uh, their son and Yoko's daughter were in the car and they had a car accident and they were all in the hospital. So um, this was John's first song back into the studio, but also he had Yoko on a hospital bed in the studio. How crazy is that? <laughs> that's just the beginning of crazy. That's a man who that's a man who's in love. Oh, dude, beyond. You know, and he really was. She could was you, Could you imagine bringing your wife to work in a hospital bed? <laughs> <laughs> it just, I'm just going to stick her in the corner. Yeah. <laughs> try try to focus on let's finishing this album. It's just kind of crazy, right? Yoko, what's Yoko. going on? Right, in traction with her feet up in the air. <laughs> <laughs> Too funny. Oh, I like what you said. Could you imagine bringing your wife to work? Right. I was like, no. And then you were like in a hospital bed. <laughs> <laughs> it's just That's another great. level, you know, another level of love and dedication, I guess. To her. And, to her, and, yeah. and as the other guys looked at it, it was a different level of lack of love and lack of things coming towards us well, that, John, this is crazy. Yeah, I can't understand why they're at, at each other's throats. <laughs> you could just say it like, hey, John, can I talk to you for a minute? Uh, you know. <laughs> Listen, before we go on, uh, Yoko's here in the hospital. <laughs> exactly, right? <laughs> I should have did that in a British accent. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, you got a minute? <laughs> I don't even do that good. All right. It was the song, the song Come Together was also banned by the BBC because it mentions Coca-Cola. So yeah. they saw it as advertising. I mean, yeah. you know, crazy. You know, you see it as advertising to plug inside. And you know what? I, you know, as a kid, I always thought about it was their way of putting in like cocaine was the, uh, was the into the song. Right. Yeah. Right. Was that, was that it? Or was it, or, you know, or were they, did they really mean Coca-Cola? I don't know. Yeah, I, I have no idea or it just fit in and it sounded good. And to me as a kid, we always thought about it, it was like referencing cocaine, you know, when we listened to this album. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So the other interesting thing about Come Together is that it was a uh, it was also a single. Uh, so they released Come Together and Something as a double A side single. Wow. And it's the only time a George Harrison song was released as a single by the Beatles. <laughs> which is something you know something was the george song it was something and something and think something of, right <laughs> but but think about that right it took it took george all the way to get to to the song something to actually make it and like be front and center yeah exactly what a all song right, so too. let's let's talk about something let's take a listen i'd like that So good, so good. Yeah. me like no other lover. Something in the way she woos me. I don't want to leave her now. So this, this song, there's a lot of um, different <laughs> uh, different stances of people about who this song is about. So mm. his wife, Patty, said, it's definitely about me. He told me that. <laughs> George says the lyric originally was something in the way he moves because he wrote it about Lord Krishna. Uh. But then he changed it because he didn't want people to think he was gay. <laughs> So, but he's also, you know, I mean, but there's also records of George saying that it was about his wife. So who knows? <laughs> One never knows. And God forbid you walk around saying that you're singing about Krishna and everybody thinks you're gay. You know, it's, yeah, uh... that was a little weird because he was totally into the whole Krishna, that whole uh, religious thing. Oh, 
and Dude. it totally fit with who he was at the time. So I, I don't, you know, I don't get it. Um, but that that's what's out there. So George also wrote this during the White Album recording sessions. Mm -hmm. He gave it, originally gave it to Joe Cocker. Joe Cocker didn't release it until 1969 on his second album. But then, th and that album came out a month after the Beatles issued the song on Abbey Road. So again, another song kind of that when we've had this before where they gave it to somebody else and then they still recorded it. And, you know, I always find that interesting. Oh, it's always the best. But, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I just chuckled a little bit because, uh, you know, George and Paul were going at it a lot on this song. Yeah. So touch on that a little bit. I have I have some thoughts on it. Yeah. Tell us about it. So when you think about it, it's a. Uh, George said the bass was too heavy and too much and taking over the song and they were going back and forth. And uh, George, uh, this was his way of actually becoming front and center. Hey, I'll show you guys. This was his bring it to the band song. So yeah. I was kind of I was kind of happy for that because, you know, the, the reason George always was in the back, they called him the shy beetle. It doesn't mean he was the less talented Beatle, that's for no. sure. No. And you know, Paul always had stuff to say about George's playing on his song on Paul songs. So <laughs> nice. I think it was a little bit of George, you know, saying, Hey, there's too much, the bass is too active on this song. Because it's a <laughs> kind of mellow song. Yeah. So it's a little bit of a little bit of revenge on Paul, you know, but uh it's interesting. Again, that that's the stress that was happening. Uh, John did say it was his favorite song on the album at one point. So, yeah, you know, I, I, I want to give one more thing. John said it was his favorite song. But there's one thing I know it sticks out in my mind about this song. And Frank Sinatra said it was the greatest song ever written. There you go. I, 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 I agree. I think I think the two George songs on this album are like among the best Beatles songs ever written by ever. far. Yeah. They're know. great. Yeah. I, you got me because I'm, uh, I just love George and everything about him. So yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah. good. Let's fight for George. Yay, George. Yay, George. John was quizzical, studied metaphysical science in the home. So Maxwell Silverhammer. There you go. With a test tube. Majoring in medicine calls her on the phone. <laughs> Can I take you out to the pictures, John? But as she's getting ready to go, a knock comes <laughs> on the door. Bang, bang, that's well silver. Nice. So that that sound effect is an actual real anvil. So Ringo was playing the anvil and it was a prop that they got that was being used by studios for cartoon sound effects. Yeah. How crazy yeah, yeah. is that, right? Well, you know, t literally throughout this, Paul made them stop the sessions till they got the anvil. Yeah. He, he had it locked in his head. Right. Like the, <laughs> this is where the challenges was coming in, man. And Hold it, it, stop everything. We're going to re-record, <laughs> but we got to get an anvil. Yeah, right. So it's a Paul song, obviously. Yeah. Um, and it, it's a medical student who kills people, but it's got this jovial boop, 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 boop kind of sound, you know? Yeah. So it was a bit, I think it was a bit of Paul's humor, actually, you know, that kind of uh, weird British humor, you know, coming out. You know, Paul could take a, a newspaper article, something he hears, and what or history or whatever it is. Yeah. You know, genius at just taking it, making it into a story, and then making it into a song. You yeah, know, that exactly. that's his that's his genius. If you threw, you know, said threw a sentence at him, and he'd come back a couple hours later with a song. Yeah, genius beyond beyond greatest, maybe one of the greatest songwriters ever in the history of songwriting. So, oh yeah, yeah, without a doubt. Um, interesting thing about this song, John is not on it at all because no. he was, uh, I think he was still in the hospital when they recorded this from that car accident. So he was in the hospital for a week and they had, you know, the Beatles had gone ahead and or kept recording and, and working on stuff. And so John isn't even on this song at all. Yeah. It's, it's not the only one that he's not on. So, um, while Paul, Paul was... I, go ahead. 
No, Paul was getting in the habit of starting to do a lot more things on songs, playing almost just about everything at times. To, right. I don't know if he was doing it to see if he could, see what he was doing, to push buttons, whatever it was. But Paul was starting to even pick up the drums. Drums. He'd sit behind the drums. He'd play the bass. He'd play guitar. And so he, he started to take over a lot in the band. Yeah. And, you know, these guys, I think, are all at their starting to get into their real peak of creativity. Mm. And I think that's part of his drive is that he didn't want to waste that because he had so much stuff coming out of him. He just wanted to, you know, move everything forward. And he still does. Yeah. He still so, does. Ball. Oh, yeah. For, for without a doubt. Yeah. And so Ringo has said this is a quote. It was the worst session ever, ever. in the ever. history of recording. He ever. said it went on for fucking weeks he thought he thought he was going mad from doing it from banging the anvil and Dude. it was again back to paul not being happy with it and you know i think what you mentioned about the competition a little bit of competition with uh brian wilson and the beach boys from yeah. what they heard off of pet sounds and, and yeah. that kind of stuff well you know paul was trying to get everything to the t he see he had this I, I, I guess in real world, you would think about a vision, but he had this sound in his head that he had to make come out and create and put it. Uh, you you say, Ringo, I know we talked about it, but yeah. you know, John and George, it was the worst session ever for either of them too as well. Uh, I heard that it was over 200 times. They 200 did takes? Wow, that's 200 crazy. Ta 200 takes where earlier when we were doing Sabbath, we talked about that they got together and did the album. <laughs> In one day yeah right right, right. yeah completely so think different about, different situation <laughs> different situation but you know what if you think about it, if you're getting to the point of 200 takes you're really just overdoing something's wrong overall yeah you know? yeah it's like you said before we talked about this last week when you get into that many takes you're you just you're just kind of going through the motions i would yeah. think i think i don't it's hard to understand how it could get better you know yeah George wanted no part of it. He yeah. left the session a couple times and came back. Yeah. <laughs> Probably had a few cocktails, came back. <laughs> Whatever it took. Yeah. All right. So let's move on. Talk about this one. Oh, darling. Oh, darling, right? Another great, great, great song. Oh, Donnie boy, that that one chord could just, it, you could play that one chord for, you know, just yeah, it's so, forever. It's, and it's such a simple song, but it's oh. so good. So the, the interesting thing about this is uh, it's a Paul song, obviously, Paul singing. He came into the studio every day for a week to sing this, and he wanted his voice voice to sound strained and raspy so he just kept coming in and doing it every day until he got to that point that's dedication yeah <laughs> and the interesting thing was it's kind of a rock song you know it's a i mean it's a slow song but it's a little heavier on the guitars than the beatles normally did and john lennon still or well not to this day because he passed away in in, in 1980 that's but point. He, he said uh he said that mccartney's vocal on this was not the greatest and he could have done it better because it was john felt like this is a john song to sing uh, and i i see that oh man you don't get me started yeah I've, I've often thought you know all the john songs are true but john's a great singer john was a great great singer he could have covered any of these the thing is, John would take it and make it into a different genre. Paul became very popish. I love the word poppy, right. but you know what I'm saying. Right, right. You know, the, no. these, and Paul, these... was, Paul was the pop guy in the Beatles, basically, and John was the rock guy. That's kind of, you there know, you how, they, how they usually broke down. I mean, they, he, he was John was right to a degree that it was more of a John song. I don't know that he could have done a better job than Paul, but. Right. It would have been know. different. I don't know if better, you know, but it would have been different for sure. Oh, for and, sure. And I'll say this. It would have been great. 
Oh, I would have yeah. liked to, I would have liked to have heard that actually. I, I actually would have too. It's, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm surprised John didn't like go out and, and play it live. That would have been amazing. Right. In the seventies. Wow, dude, that would have been great. Great song. That's all yeah. I could say. I mean, here's a Ringo tune. Octopus's garden. I'd like to be under the sea in an octopus's garden in the shade. He'd let us in, knows where we've been in his octopus's garden in the shade. <laughs> I'd ask my friends to come and see an octopus's garden with me. That's great. So this song, uh, you know, Ringo song, obviously, as you can hear Ringo's distinctive voice there. Um, but it, when they did the White Album and there was all this friction, unrest with the band, Ringo went on a boating trip with his family and they're on deck and they, they had lunch and the captain offered him octopus for lunch. <laughs> so Ringo didn't eat the octopus, but the captain started telling him all this stuff about octopi and octopuses and, and undersea and how tranquil it is. And Ringo's like, wow, that's amazing. I, I wonder what if, uh, you know, what it would be like if the band was like that, as opposed to all this fighting and, and problems they were doing. So that's how that song came about. It's kind of Ringo, you know, yearning for that, uh, you know, kind of togetherness that they used to have. What does it take to have somebody talk to you about octopi? It's never happened to me. <laughs> it never happened to me either. I guess they got to offer it to you for lunch. Yeah. You got a couple of minutes to not talk to you about octopi. But you know what? The brilliance of what we're saying. Great song. The piano work in there just killer throughout, right? Yeah. And yeah. we all, we, you, if you break the songs down like we're trying to do when we get inside the album, the brilliance behind them. Yeah, Ringo wrote it. The band came together. They jammed and all different styles, all different flavors, but absolutely amazing. Amazing. Yeah, great result. And you can see again in the Let It Be film, if you can get a copy of it. You can see them working on this song and George is working with Ringo and kind of making the song better. So, you know, again, while while there was a lot of separatism at this time with the Beatles, there was also still that musicianship where they would help each other with the songs. And, and the end result was always better than than, you know, how it started out as a solo. Yeah. You know, George and Ringo had a tremendous love for each other. And I, I can tell you that they always did and always will, you know, forever. Yeah. 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 You know, it was it was it was a difference. I think they all loved one another, like we were saying. Sure. But the band got to the point where, you know, now it was just like, this is so overwhelming. You know, our life is no longer good, right? Right. And time for a shift. Yeah, yep. time for a change. And that's what happened after, after this album, they were done, you know, and that was it. So, yeah. But what a great album. Yeah. This one is I Want You. She's so heavy. So the interesting thing about this song mm. uh, is it's it went, well one of the interesting things there was a few but it was the last song that they uh, they mixed uh, for Abbey Road so the the mixing of this was the last time that all four Beatles were in the studio together ah 
they also uh, put this together from two unfinished songs. So it was, again, you, the Beatles, I think, did this a lot, but uh, especially on this album, like they, when we get to side two, these, these little pieces of songs were all kind of hanging around. And it was just, I don't want to say it was their trash, but it was not stuff that they had developed into full songs. And even though it's like stuff they had like laying around or pieces of things they had around, it, it's just amazing what they do with it. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like this so much better was their, their leftovers were so much better than everything else that, you know, has been done in a long time. And you know what the thing is, how would you like a little piece of what the Beatles had laying around, right? Make a career for yourself. Hey, take this. It's just laying around. But, you know, again, it comes down to when they started to do these songs, it freed them up. You know, yeah. there wasn't as much pressure on it. Hey, try this, throw this with this. That's what they came down to. I think it was their exit strategy to let's get through this. Let's right. get it done and see what we can do. Yeah. So they, they also, it's actually the second longest Beatles song. The only longer song is Revolution Number no. 9. <laughs> which I don't know, a lot of people would say that's not even a song. <laughs> it's just kind of stream of conscious stuff. Um, but this, yeah, this song's almost eight minutes long. So it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a very long song. It's the first time we talked about the Moog synthesizer. So uh, this is the first uses of, of that synthesizer on a record. Uh, and then with the, John had gotten into a, a very heavy blues sound and we'd have been playing around with it. And so that kind of drives that kind of almost grungy sound that they have. Uh, and then they also layered uh, the guitars. So they did multiple overdubs to kind of make it really thick. And, in, you know, the end result, you see, you hear it there. That was amazing. Just, just tremendous, tremendous song. Yeah. So let's move over to side two. All right. It starts off with another great George song. So it's a lot of short songs that kind of all, you know, go together. So this whole second side of the album. Oh, I got you. Yep. Yeah. So let's take a little listen to Here Comes the Sun. This song, I mean, again, I think this is a, just a phenomenal song. One of my all-time favorites. Um, it's just so happy and pleasant, and and you know, it's not poppy, but it's just happy. You know, that's that's the best word I think for it. It's uh, it's musical. Yeah, I mean, you know, when you think about it, right? If you put it, it's just musical. It's uplifting. It's just everything about it. Right. And again. Sometimes we take it for granted with the Beatles and you just listen to these songs because you've heard them so many times. Sure. But if you sit down and really listen to the, you know, the music, the music, musicmanship, whatever it might be, the word. <laughs> musicianship. You, musicianship. Thank you. you. <laughs> it's just, just tremendous. You know, you got four guys who are the best of the best at doing what they were doing. Yeah. You got to sometimes... And that's the greatest part about do, us doing this is I get to sit down and I really get to listen to these albums. And my God, this is amazing. Yeah. And if you listen to it in the headphones, uh, you can hear the beginning part is on one channel yep. and then it moves to the whole spectrum. So it's right and left. It's a little weird panning thing they're doing. Uh, but the song was written by George in at Eric Clapton's house. They're outside with a couple of guitars walking around. They sat down and Clapton said, this just flowed right out of George. Like he came up with it just sitting on the on the lawn. It, it's insane. Um, <laughs> and he said it actually was a sunny day in England, which I, you know, the, the, <laughs> that was something that probably changed them. And he had this bright sunny day. It was in the spring and, and you know, he just sat down and bam, it comes out of him like insane. That's a great point. I didn't realize it was written in England. So that's got to tell you something. You could wait weeks for Here Comes the Sun. 
Yeah, so. right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. But he actually, and he played it on one of Clapton's acoustic guitars. So he was at Clapton's house. They bar, they each had a guitar, and they were just walking around outside and sat down and started playing. Yeah, I think good things can happen when you hang out with Eric Clapton. Yeah, of course. Well, yeah, and that there, there's a lead. You know, that's the the relationship between them and the thing with the wives, and and there's a uh, whole. You could do sh multiple shows about Eric Clapton and George Harrison. Yeah. Um, did you know and they I, actually toured together in Japan? They did like twelve sure. shows together. That would have been got, killer. I didn't realize. I've got, that. I've got the album. Oh, okay. Oh, <laughs> yeah dude, tremendous oh i didn't even know oh. there was an album of that I oh yeah that. yeah okay, oh cool. oh my god it's it's tremendous george it's like it's george's greatest hits yeah recorded live in japan wow i think it was from 2004 yeah yeah early 2000s yeah yeah yeah, yeah just so there, you'll, you'll love it the other thing on this there was no john on this record <laughs> because john and george were fighting at the time and ah. and john was just not playing on George's songs, which is, you know, uh, why? I, I, let it go. <laughs> you know, this is a great opportunity to be part of a, an amazing all-time legendary song. Yeah, but that that's just it. The littlest, smallest things was, I'll show you. You were just saying George was, hey, hey Paul, look what I just did. And right. John saying, I'm not going to play on your song. Right. It's Dude, a lot it's of done. screw you on this <laughs> yeah, album, yeah, you know, yeah. unfortunately. Which it, 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 it's amazing that it's so good with all this kind of angst that's happening with the guys a little here comes the sun I, I ran a marathon and uh this was the song that ran through my head for 26 miles i just kept reminding myself because it started early in the morning and i was on the beach running on the boardwalk and i saw the sun coming up nice I swear to god i just kept that going here it just kept you going sun. yeah <laughs> nice you know, yeah so this was a part of my life this song and uh Literally, the marathon was just always there. And it's still in my head that I can remember it like it was yesterday. Yeah, great that's stuff. great. Yeah. So this song, there was also a guitar solo recorded by George, but they didn't use it. So that's out there. And I think you can hear it somewhere. There's outtakes of, uh, I think, George's son and, and uh, George Martin playing it. So you could actually hear wow. the solo that they had recorded but decided not to use. And then this song, when the Beatles uh, songs got onto iTunes, that was 2010 when that happened. This song was the top selling song that week. So they, you know, had a huge number of downloads for Beatles songs when they went live on iTunes. But yep. here comes the song. Here comes the sun was the song that everybody really kind of identified with and, and wanted to get a hold of. Wow. You know, just talking, Don, you know, with the, the catalog of Beatles songs, it would be great. Maybe it's something we'll do, you know, we'll throw it out there. You know, what is your favorite Beatles song, right? Because I'd love to know because there's so many, you know, and for me, it's, I'll just throw it out there. It's a hard pick. For, for me, the song that I have to say is, you know, it's probably While My Guitar Gently Weeps. That's right? a great for one. Me. Yeah, it's a great one, but it had the most impact on me. So that's yeah. why I would go with that. But I imagine we'd get so many people so many different answers we'll try that out when we oh go yeah forward. yeah yep. definitely i would love to do that and yeah very down cool. the road uh so let's move on to the next song on side two and to me the melody part i think kind of begins with this song most people will say it begins with you never give me your money or sun king but mm. let's listen to because whoops as soon as don can get his shit together mm. So a John Lennon song. So I want you to listen to the harmonies. So 
this song came about uh john walked in on yoko and she was at the piano playing moonlight Son sonata by beethoven mm. so out of the blue john's like hey can you play that backwards <laughs> <laughs> so, sure so she she played you know and it's basically just reversed the the order of the chords not play <laughs> notes backwards but that's what John built this song around that it's basically Midnight Sonata by Beethoven backwards. Backwards. Wow. Yeah. And those Good. harmonies, which to me just it sends chills up my up my spine here in those. Um, it's John, Paul and George, and then they tripled it. So they did these mm. harmonies and they layered a lot of layering going on in this album. And so it gets that really kind of it sounds kind of like a choir almost in the background, right? Yeah, it, well, it certainly is. It's the way it's put together. And, you know, I, I say it all the time. John's voice was amazing. Uh, I'll repeat it again. There was just something about that guy and his voice. I used to say it to my friends all the time. I wish John would sing more. I mean, yeah, I yeah, really did. I agree. Yeah. I, I like his voice a lot as well. Yeah. Um, interesting thing about the song. John didn't like the final arrangement, but uh, both Paul and George said it was their favorite song on the album. Nice. All right, so let's move on. We're going to get here into this melody part and start off with this one. Uh, you never give me your money. Mm. And this is a Paul song. So, you know, the song takes off and I think probably most people know it. It, it. It's actually parts of four songs all put together. So that was interesting. Again, the, this is kind of, you know, I hate saying trash or scraps or whatever, but it's like stuff. They're just taking it little bits here, little bits there and putting it all together. Yeah, building a bridge. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, the other thing was that Paul, a lot of, has been said about Paul. Uh, this is them again dealing with that frustration they had of having to deal with all the business side of stuff after Brian Epstein had died in 1967. Mm. So that line about, you know, you never give me your money, you only give me the funny papers. Funny papers, Because yeah. they used to, they would say, well, on paper, you're worth this. And Paul would go, well, where is it? I don't have that money. <laughs> it's true like on paper you know the promise of the future it's there hang in there fellas right, right. yeah so, so that's like that's kind of the beginning of that that melody uh of songs on side two um and then the next series of songs all the rest of the songs on the album are, are like two minutes or less so they're very short little snippets and again there were pieces of things that they had a, a lot of them um, so let's take a listen to Sun King. And this one's a John song. Dude, these little snippets are killer. I know, right? <laughs> Everything about this. So good. So this song has a lot of reverb on it and they got the idea to record it with that reverb after hearing Fleetwood Mac's Albatross. Nice. The original Fleetwood Mac. Yeah. Oh yeah. So uh, part of this song or part of the lore around the song was that jo John was kind of needling George. And at one point, John wanted to call it Here Comes the Sun King. 
<laughs> so again, they're kind of like, you know, poking and twisting the knife. With, uh, it's, you know, it's their brother. Great. these guys are brothers at this point. And it's, yeah. you know, you're messing around with your brother. Uh, but I'm going to one up you. Here you go. You got here comes the sun. I've got here comes the sun. King. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Take that. So it, it, that song, Sun King, gives us that beginning of that melody portion. And a lot of these songs now from here on out are not even, they're just like a minute long, maybe two minutes, but most of them are, are under two minutes. So let's take a listen to this one. This is Mean Mis Mr. Mustard. Mean Mr. Mustard sleeps in the dark, shapes in the dark, trying to save paper. So this song was written by John in 1967 when the Beatles were in India with the Maharishi. Mm. And so again, it was like, a, it's a minute seven. It was a little something that he had. It was almost on the White Album, but they decided not to use it there. Well, you think about it, right? You just hit me now as they're flowing into one another. You got these songs that you never completed. And the genius that goes to, you know, scotch taping these, duct taping these together, right? Just yeah. what, unbelievable. It, well, it really is. And in what order and what goes where. And we have, a, I have a story about a, 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 a interesting thing, a real interesting thing about the, the last song on the album mm. um, was originally in between two other songs. So we'll talk about that a little bit too. Yeah. Um, but here's the other one that John said was kind of a talk. He said, Mean Mr. Mustard and Polythene Pam were kind of like toss off stuff that he had around that he wrote, you know, again, back in 67 when they were in India, but they just never used it. So here's Polythene Pam. Listen to that. So that song, um, John actually leans into uh, the Liverpool accent, you know, and because mm -hmm. the Beatles, since they were raised on American music, they really didn't have strong British accents, you know, they, they really, they didn't, they were more Americanized, I think, because of their exposure to TV and, and music from the States. Yeah, a lot of it happens when you sing, it changes, you know, your accent changes. When they spoke, you could hear the accents all yeah, the time. Yeah, you could hear it you know? more. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But when they sang, you know, kind of they lost their British accent. But I will say, Polythene Pam, tremendous song. Oh, I tremendous. love it. I love it. And, you know, <laughs> you, you lose a little bit when you don't listen to this just straight through. Like, we're chopping it up here. Yeah. But it's so it flows so well. It's such genius in the way these songs kind of go from one to the next. And, and then you get this one, which to me is, is one of my all time favorites. And this is the, the lead in. So another Paul song, which is great. Yeah. Um, and Paul actually plays lead guitar on that one. Wow. So a uh, story about this, uh, Paul was in a cab in New York City and uh, he, he saw that the driver's name was Quits, Q-U-I-T-T-S. And on the little <laughs> card, it said ex-police department. So that's where that whole quit the police department thing came from. <laughs> to get a steady job so i thought being a cop was a pretty steady job myself but well just like you know poetic license fantastic fantastic yeah. way to take it and run 
so I have uh, no idea how yeah and george also played bass on this song which is interesting so since paul was playing lead guitar george did the bass part i'll show you how easy it is yeah exactly <laughs> let's not forget you know joe cocker and the version of she came in through the bathroom window just itself became a completely iconic song oh yeah That's yeah tremendous. great performance of it right oh one of the best joe cocker just loved doing the beatles songs yeah you know well, they were they were all they were all together they were all great friends you know yeah mad dogs and englishmen just tremendous album great hey, album. there we go there's something we could talk about yes definitely <laughs> Great. So let's talk about Golden Slumbers. Another Paul song. Once there was a way to get back homeward. Once there was a way to get back home. Sleep pretty darling, do not cry. Sing a lullaby. Golden so fill your eyes. Smile Damn. you when you rise. Sleep pretty darling, do not cry. So this song, uh, Paul actually wrote this on his stepsister's piano. So he saw her songbook had this song Golden Slumbers in it and he couldn't read music. He's I don't I still oh. don't think he reads music. No, he um, doesn't. So he just made up his own song and kind of uh worked off the original lyrics from that song. Wow. So that's interesting. And yeah, again Paul's, Paul's always done everything by ear. Yeah, yeah. So it's amazing how many, you know, very super talented musicians just don't even especially rock, they don't read music, you know, that's generally not something that you find a lot they of just rock. Well, right. you hear his voice in that song, man. Oh, it's amazing to me that, amazing. that wow, again, chill. You know, it, I always like to say, you know, you can pick your favorite songs, you can do what you want. You know, there's nothing better than this song. There might be some that are tied, but there's nothing better. <laughs> Yeah, and on this again, no John. So John was in the hospital <laughs> from the car accident. So they recorded this with Paul on the piano and George on bass again. So, you know, they mix it up a little bit and and that's what the result that they got. Quite the result, my friend. Yes, sir. Let's take a listen to Carry That Weight. give me your money mm -hmm. right they play that that little that riff little in there lick. that's awesome yeah. i love it yeah so, so uh, it's a paul song and mm -hmm. uh, allegedly it was written about like the struggle to keep the beatles together after brian died ah. and so you know you see this so you, and i i correlate this to like mike Tus tyson when he lost customato customato passed away and mike tyson like went off the rails right yeah so same thing so it's about oh. brian epstein after he died the beatles kind of became rudderless you know he was kind of holding them together and i think oh. that you know so this song is paul's expression of of that kind of struggle because he kind of became the default guy to kind of keep things together when when stuff was falling apart yeah you know having a daddy figure right somebody has to be the leader yeah yeah exactly so you know it, even though it's a collaborative effort with four super talented guys, somebody's got to drive the ship. Yep. So let's take a listen to the end, which again, great, great song. Here's that drum solo. So good.
So my favorite thing about this song oh, is is everything. <laughs> but it's like the it, the way it breaks down. All right, when it comes down. Uh, oops. Uh, so it comes down to this breakdown part after being so rocking, and it just is so mellow. And I love that you know the line in there that says, "In the end." The love you take is equal to the love you make and it's yeah. just basically everything about the beatles yeah right i mean that's who the beatles were it's all about that yeah one of the, one of the greatest lyrics ever written yeah you know and, and just the way it flowed at the end the, to end the song just, just so gorgeous and, that that part you just played just now with the guitar work dude it went right through me just uh oh just yeah brought, this is what i'm saying about take these albums and listen to them don't just play them. Right. Listen. <laughs> because, and the thing you notice when you do listen to that guitar solo part is those are three different solos by each of the, the guitar players. So John, Paul, and George each played the different guitar solo part. And you can hear the differences as it shifts, the different styles. Just so powerful. I, I just, I got goosebumps sitting here listening to it when, when it was going through my head. Amazing. Yeah. Just beautiful. And Ringo hated the drum solo. He didn't want to do it. Paul had to talk him into doing it, saying it was necessary for the transition between the songs. And Ringo said later that there was no way he could ever recreate that if he tried. And wow. it's so iconic, you know, it's yeah. so boom, 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 you know, I mean, it's classic. So yeah. good. So that's amazing that even though he didn't like it, it was something he was not into. It was still uh, iconic. You know, you and I have both got to see McCartney, so we know it when when he's done this live. It was just one of the great one, one of the greatest breath. That's a great way to perfect breathtaking. You couldn't explain it to anyone. You'd have to be there to feel what to I feel felt. It and experience it live. Right? It's yeah. crazy. Crazy. I still did. Uh, what a great moment. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. And the last song, which is, uh, you know, uh, I, th I think this is the, officially the, f the first ever hidden track on a, on a record. That's, that's what I have uh, read. Um, so let's take a listen. Her Majesty's a pretty nice girl, but she doesn't have a lot to say. Her Majesty's a pretty nice girl, but she changes from day to day. I want to tell her that I love her wow. a lot, but I gotta get a belly full of wine. My majesty's a pretty nice girl. Someday I'm going to make a mine. Oh, yeah. Someday I'm going to make a mine. Okay, so mm. interesting thing about this song. And uh, it was originally in between Mean Mr. Mustard and Polythene Pam on side two of the of the album. Paul didn't like it there. So he's in there with the engineer. He had the engineer cut it out. And in those days, it wasn't digital. Everybody, you cut tape with a razor. You find the tape, you cut it, you cut the piece out, and then you taped it, put it together. Yeah. I used to do that when I was yeah. back in radio. Um, so the engineer cut it out and the floor was on the literal, the tape was literally on the floor. So it was on the cutting room floor. There you go. So the guy who was the engineer hated throwing anything out. So he said, all right, well, I'm going to take this. He takes a little bit of, they call it leader tape and you could stick it on. That's how he connected the two pieces of tape. So he connected it down uh, to the end of the album basically and forgot about it. And they sent it out to be put onto wax so they could listen to it to make a record out of it. So they got it back and everybody's like, wow, that's great. And it was just down at the end of the, you know, it was at the end of the album where nobody had planned for it. They didn't change it at all. But you can hear the parts that it's because it was kind of a cat. It wasn't a real precise cut. It was a very casual. Paul's just said, get rid of it. So he slapped it out and they were going <laughs> to fix it later. But that beginning chord. So the electric chord at the beginning is from the end of Mean Mr. Mustard. That's where that comes from. And That's then at the great. very end, when it cuts out, it's because that last chord is actually in the beginning of Polythene Pam, and you can't hear it under that song. But that's why the song like goes bum ba da ba uh, and it's like doesn't end right, right? It's like cut off. <laughs> it's so good too, you know. So Her crazy. Majesty's a great song. Listen to oh, the guitar work in there too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unbelievable, great but, stuff. Yeah, interesting story about how that happened. So again, another happy accident. Uh, you know, the studios where it all happens, man. The magic happens. It really does. 
Yeah. Imagine right. putting Beatle albums together. Just, I just know, imagine. Right? Insane. I was part of it. You know, this this was great, Don. Yeah. Wow, man. So the, there's Abbey Road by the Beatles. Wow. Great job. Thanks, man. Yep. Loved and, it. Loved everything about it. Yeah. Just an all time great. And so next week, we're going to do something crazy. We're going to jump out of the 60s and 70s right uh -oh. into the 90s. Uh oh. Getting out of Tommy's comfort zone. <laughs> and we are going to do the album 10 by Pearl Jam. So 1991, I think it was, but we'll, you know, delve into that. We'll get into a little bit different genre, a little harder rock. Um, but it should be fun. So we'll see you All next right. week. It's going to be fun. Awesome. All right. Have a good one. Take care. See you, Don.